The folks that I'm talking about today are not combatants in the traditional Third Geneva Convention sense, um, but I guess the question I'm starting with is what are they um, and why are they what they are? Uh, so I'm calling them uh, vigilantes, uh, at least insofar as uh, the Indian police often act in an extra legal capacity, which is something I don't think is unique to India, um, but I think it, it manifests in very particular ways there. And um, essentially what I'm calling police vigilantism in contemporary India is something that's really become routinized both in discourse among the public or various publics, um, a wide swath anyway, uh, as well as in practice by police themselves. And vigilantism by police does take various kinds of forms, uh, but the one I'm going to focus on mainly is what are called encounter killings. Now encounter killings occur in ostensibly spontaneous um, shootouts between police and suspected criminals. Uh, they're generally framed as you know, something that just kind of came up and happened. Um, and it's, it's something that's become increasingly, as I said, routinized. Uh, both the number, the numbers are increasing of actual events and also the prevalence across uh, various parts of India. Uh, it's also been increasing over the last two decades. Um, especially though not exclusively in places where there are insurgency campaigns like Jammu and Kashmir or um, in what they call the Red Corridor where um, Maoist or Naxalite uh, insurgents are active. Um, and also in large urban areas like Mumbai, Delhi, um, and other places where organized crime is known to have a real kind of foothold. And I just wanted to show you a few slides to indicate kind of the, again, the routinization or really the banality of these kinds of killings. Um, I've, I've just selected here a few, just some snippets from the newspaper from when I was doing my uh, field work in 2006 and 7. Um, and what I wanted to emphasize is, I mean, you can see how kind of tiny these stories are. This is not front page news. It's not, it doesn't make a big splash, really. You'll find these on pages four, five, six of the newspaper, um, you know, and always notorious. I was always interested in how these, the people who were being killed were, were these so-called notorious criminals and gangsters. Um, and the practice has even become so uh, ubiquitous that it has its own Wikipedia entry. This is a screenshot. Um, and as you can see, it, it calls the encounter or encounter killings a euphemism for extrajudicial killings um, by the police or armed forces of either suspected gangsters or terrorists in gang battles. So you can see already this kind of collapsing of criminality, terrorism, and an especially um, interesting epithet that's come up is this idea of the fake encounter. Um, now, what do people mean by fake? In my paper, I go into more detail about you know, how this distinction is made, and there are various ways that it's made. Um, but basically, the idea of it being fake is that it's not spontaneous. It's actually a pre-planned operation, uh, indeed a state-sponsored execution of someone. Um, and I do want to be clear that there are, like, encounter killings themselves do not always take the same form. It may be a pre-planned operation or it may be spontaneous. And this is often the, the zone of indistinction where people are like, well, what, what did happen? What kind of incident was this? Um, but there is this sort of acceptance often among the, again, various swaths of the public that many encounters are in fact carefully planned, um, essentially assassinations that are explicitly intended to destroy their targets. Not that it was some kind of accident that happened when the police went out to investigate and arrest someone. Um, and the really important thing that I want to think through today is why it seems there's also no clear consensus among people that this is an illegitimate practice. In fact, you often see a substantial amount of tacit or even active support for this kind of organized violence by police. And this is just one example. Um, this was printed in India Today. It's kind of India's version of Time magazine or, or Newsweek or something where um, a, a senior officer in the state of Gujarat, whom you may have, uh, well, the state you may have heard a lot about recently, since that's uh, where the projected prime minister, Narendra Modi, uh, was chief minister, a very controversial figure. We'll find out tomorrow, I think, how this all actually plays out. Um, and that's the other thing I want to say, too, is that these are very politicized killings in many ways. And on the right here, you can see uh, a group of members of parliament, MPs under a statue of Gandhi, protesting the practice, um, saying, you know, in a kind of, um, I guess what Amy might, like a human rights sort of discourse, this global idea that this is unjust. But on the other side, on the left, you see a crowd of people, of men, 
mainly, uh, who are actually rallying around the senior officer who planned the operation and is being charged with this um, state-sponsored murder. Uh, it says they're garlanding him, which is a sign of reverence, um, and uh, really kind of defending him and saying, for whatever reason, they think that this was the right thing to do. So as you can see here, there's a lot of ambivalence um, you know, among the public uh, about this practice and what it means. And we might match it or kind of think with it um, with this. This is a story I just saw on Al Jazeera the other day, and I thought I'd include um, you might know an Amnesty International released this report that uh, I think in, they said 141 countries, torture still happens. This is kind of a big duh to us, I think. But um, one thing that did catch my eye was this, these statistics. They interviewed something like 21,000 people. I'm not sure what proportion of that was people from India. But of those people, they say that 74% um, actually did believe or express a belief that torture is sometimes necessary. Um, so kind of thinking through what that means, um, and especially how these kinds of acts of violence um, are mediated in various ways, I think is it's really important. Um, and the media doesn't just reflect the ambivalence or the, you know, the public kind of questioning of whether this is a good or bad or right thing, um, but there's, there's also this way in which you see a kind of um, praising of police in the Indian media for their success in encounters. And this has led to the development of what are called encounter specialists. Um, and I have here, this is a, a collection of photos of some of the most famous encounter specialists in India. They're these kind of hero figures. Um, who also have avatars in a lot of popular Bollywood films, a number of which I, I discuss in the, the longer version of this paper. And um, I'm not going to go through all the details of who's who, but I will point out um, the guy on the top there, uh, Vijay Salaskar, who um, did actually die in the, uh, I'm sure you remember, the 2008 uh, attacks in Mumbai. He and uh, two team members, uh, they, they were fighting terrorists, and so he is now um, held up as this kind of anti-terror martyr. Um, and the guy below him, this kind of going kind of down in clockwise order, is uh, named Pradeep Sharma. Um, he's also with the Mumbai police and known as the Badsha or emperor of encounter killings. Um, apparently involved in more than 300 of them. And the numbers that you see there by the names are the body counts. So, so these, these men, um, they're actually, part of their celebrity is the sort of number of people that they can claim to have killed. Um, in these sorts of shootouts. And so I'm trying to think through what this signals um, about uh, the possibility of a kind of public culture of police vigilantism and what that means uh, in contemporary India. Um, so what I argue is that, uh, indeed, I mean, there are a lot of sort of boilerplate explanations for this, that you know, organized crime has increased, a generalized feeling of insecurity, um, a discourse of corruption, and I, indeed, I think all these things, plus a kind of, you know, a, a generalized history of what we might call a lack of state accountability is, is part of the issue. But what I want to look at today uh, is also a kind of cosmology, of like why this might seem justifiable um, in moral or religious terms to, to many people um, as a kind of war. Um, where, so I'm saying that these figures, in many ways, they're kind of seen as a sort of spiritual warrior who's fighting not simply criminality or terrorism that is of this world, um, but fighting uh, a kind of spiritual war at universal, national, and even internal to an individual levels. Um, and so this war needs to be fought by a very specific kind of soldier. Um, and I think it remains a question as to why police have become this sort of special type of warrior. Um, but essentially, the, it, you can see in all sorts of um, both popular media, uh, as well as uh, news that uh, they're, they're considered to be, you know, kind of fighting for something in the way of purity of the nation. You know, there's all this discourse that India has become completely corrupt. Electoral politics has become not just corrupt, but criminalized. Um, I think in the last count, out of 543 members of parliament, um, something like 35% of them, or more than 100, actually had criminal records. Um, and not just for you know, we might call white collar or crimes, but I mean, heinous crimes, like inciting violence, rape, kidnapping. Um, so there's this idea that, um, that politics itself has become corrupted and, and criminal all over India. And so the question then becomes, well, who's gonna fight it? Or, you know, how is that all going to work? 
So I argue that um, in, in the Indian context, the way this fight takes place is through three primary elements, uh, ritual purification, social defense, um, and self-sacrifice. And these are not distinct or these aren't exclusive from one another. I think they all kind of work through this figure. Um, and it is a very individualized kind of hero or maybe anti-hero figure of, of the encounter specialist um, or, or police vigilante, to, to put it more broadly. So um, I'm going to focus mostly, since I just have a very few minutes here, on the question of purification. Um, which is uh, something that, again, I think is not, it's not unique to the Indian situation, but I think it manifests through particular cultural tropes, um, largely related to um, Hindu philosophy and epic myth, but uh, I don't want to also, I don't want to just say that this is only a Hindu thing. There are Islamic elements and even Christian um, elements. Someone, I think, yesterday brought up the question of martyrs and Roman Catholicism, and, and that's, that's there as well. Um, but uh, you see things like in this quote from you know, the Badshah himself, Mr. 113 Pradeep Sharma, he's quoted actually in Time magazine, an American magazine, that interviewed him uh, as saying, criminals are filth and I am the cleaner. Um, so there's this idea that um, you know, bringing order to society um, means actually a kind of purification, a kind of cleaning. Um, and I think we do need to think about the resonances that not just statements, but images like this one have with some others with which we might be a little bit more familiar. Um, I'm sure probably most of you recognize the guy at the top there, Dirty Harry. And um, I think Dirty Harry is actually a really, really interesting figure to, to think with um, in terms of not just the way police are, you can say, morally tainted by the violence that they are authorized um, to use in the name of some greater social good, um, and that's often the way that Dirty Harry is invoked, that his dirtiness actually has to do with his violence. But I don't know how many people have actually seen the film. If you actually watch uh, the movie, the only time, the one time where Dirty Harry actually articulates his own dirtiness, it's actually after he's just sort of saved a man who's about to commit suicide. It's, it's sort of not even part of the main plot. It's this kind of side project. Um, and he does so in such a way that, you know, he goes up on the roof and says to the guy, you know, can you just give me your name and address? Because you're going to make such a damn mess when you fall and I've got to clean it up, you know. <laughs> and the guy gets so mad he lunges at him and Harry kind of saves the day and brings him down. So maybe a different kind of, you know, violent means to uh, a just end. But after that, Harry says to his partner, you know, that's why they call me Dirty Harry. Every dirty job that comes along. And again, in this, I don't think he's speaking just about violence in the sense of using his capacity to deploy physical coercion, but really this idea that, you know, we're called upon all the time to maintain order, not just using whatever means necessary, but, you know, in all contexts as necessary. Um, and so trying to think through, you know, what police are for and what kind of order it is that we are entreating them or really demanding of them to produce, um, I think that's a really key part of all of this. And again, in the Indian context, uh, it manifests through this idea of clean orderliness, manifests in all kinds of ways. Um, but one of the most interesting comes in this. This is sort of an everyday thing. You'll sort of, um, Hindi speakers are often very, they're very fond of using proverbs. And I won't say the Hindi, but in English, there's one that translates to police are like coal. If you're their friend, your hands will turn black. If you're their enemy, your hands will be burnt. And um, what I, what I find so interesting about this quote uh, is, that, is the idea that it's not just the police themselves um, as individual or even institutional actors who are dirty, but um, they're, they're kind of a contagion. I mean, there's something that is integrated with society such that you know, we are interacting with police in some way, shape, or form, and how you interact with them, how you think about them, you know, it kind of determines even you as a subject and your dirtiness, your potential cleanliness. Um, so yeah, I'm just trying to rush through now that I only have five minutes. This is a really important idea, um, especially when you think about um, ideas of caste uh, as related to occupation and something that you're born into. Um, there is this idea that police are a very particular kind of caste, um, indeed, maybe a warrior caste, or it's a question, right? Like what kind of, uh, what kind of caste is there? Um, what kind of caste element to, to a state agent, uh, which we think of as generally something that comes out of the colonial moment. It's this modern, rational, legal invention, but of course it's going to be imbricated with all of these other cultural and historical 
um, kind of factors. And this is just another image um, from, again, a film that I detail in my paper called Ganga Jal, uh, which translates to holy water. It's water of the holy Ganga River. And what you see here in this image is the police officer, not in uniform, but uh, he's the senior superintendent of the area, who's essentially beating up, thrashing uh, these two criminals in the Ganga River, which is, you know, the sacred river of Shiva, which, you know, is Shiva the destroyer. There's this idea that in, in order to create or produce a good, a spiritually clean and good order, you, you have to destroy first. Um, so again, this links up with um, ideas that, you know, all of India's society somehow, some way, and people have different theories of how, um, has become corrupted. Um, and indeed, that's very much what's at stake in the, the current elections. Um, if, if you read any of the news reports, you'll see that everyone says, you know, we want the next, we just want change. Whoever the next leader is, we just want it to be someone different who will root out corruption and the, this kind of all-encompassing and ubiquitous uh, corruption of the Indian system. And um, I won't go too much into the idea of self-defense or social defense generally, um, except to say that Again, in the Indian context, where the idea is that all of, of politics really has become polluted, um, some have argued that the police may sometimes represent a figure who can actually save society or protect society from politics. Um, but in order to do that, they themselves often have to become a kind of sacrificial victim or a sacrificial perpetrator. You know, again, we have to kind of think through how, how these categories are working together. Um, but another element of the, the sort of warrior figure is this idea of self-sacrifice. Um, and just to finish up, uh, I wanted to show you a few images from what's known as the Police Shahid Diwas, or Police Martyr Day. And this is actually an annual ritual where every October 21st or 26th, end of October, um, police across the country celebrate um, their brethren who have died in the line of duty just that year. Um, and in Uttar Pradesh, which is uh, the largest state in India, the state where I've mainly done my, my field work, um, you can actually see, I mean, they, every year they have the highest number. The year I was there, I think it was 130, 130 police officers who had died just in the last year. So there is um, something, I think, to think about in terms of the vulnerability of this figure also, that they're not just perpetrating violence and out there planning attacks and um, and executing and assassinating people, but they are also putting themselves at risk. And then, so how is that mediated? How does that become, you know, a part of, of the police's figure? And what results does that have? I think one result is that, uh, in many ways, this kind of vigilantism, this sort of acting outside the law um, in the service of the public, the social good, you know, whatever the ideal is, and it is a shifty, sort of category. It's something that's seen as, as virtuous, not just as, you know, a kind of survival and, you know, you just have to do what's necessary just to get by, but it's actually something that people understand as a way to instill good order, not just, you know, a kind of tolerable or keeping it together, barely hanging on kind of order. So I think thinking about extra legality, um, and a very particular kind of organized violence by the state. Um, it really it raises a lot of the questions that I think we've already been talking about in terms of you know, what does it mean to do this kind of violence? You know, when is it legitimated? How is it legitimated? When is it delegitimated? Um, the, you saw the guys who were rallying around the senior officer. I mean, that was a case where he was in many, he was sacrificed, not physically, but he was sacrificed insofar as he essentially had to go to jail um, for, for planning this operation, which is a rare event. I mean, as many um, cases of this kind of uh, encounter killing has happened, most of the time police are not prosecuted. And so this is what, you know, many human rights activists and NGOs, you know, this is what they're saying, you know, we are clearly not fitting in, you know, with this larger, with this need that we have. But, but the police are fitting in, I would argue, with another kind of need, or at least a desire, uh, for popular justice, whatever that means, and orderliness. So um, I think it's really important to bring that into conversation, um, not just with the idea of perpetrators, but with the idea of um, kind of virtuous violence and what it means to, to do violence in a moral way. Uh, and I'll just stop there. Thanks.